Thank you. Uh, <coughs> first of all, I, I, I would like to thank you uh, and uh, Dr. Nina Jovanovic for inviting me again. And I'm very happy to be here in Sarajevo. I mean, it's, uh, it's always a pleasure for me. And secondly, I, in this session, I can see that we are, like ocular oncology sessions before macular surgery. Uh, and macular surgery is the last session, so it's surprising. <laughs> and third, I watched, I mean, amazing surgeries. I'm, I'm like intrigued with the surgeries, how they performed by uh, my colleagues, my um, elder ones. But I mean, amazing, amazing hands. I mean, uh, very clean surgeries. But I have to say, I, as far as I could underst understand from the conversation and from the translation a little bit, uh, I do perform PLSU surgeries, which is anterior resection of the tumors, which is easy to manage, easy to hold the tumor and take the tumor out without touching the whole uh, body of the tumor. But for posterior segment uh, tumors, they are, they are larger, as we see, and I'm really, really suspicious about like, uh, the dispersion of these cells somewhere else. I wouldn't really try to do the surgery. I can do the surgery, but I wouldn't really try before uh, radiating them. I, and of course, tumor disease syndrome, if you have that, we should go in, and which, which is not very common. Uh, that's my opinion on this, so thank you very much. So I will talk about plaque brachytherapy for intraocular tumors, but um, I will talk mostly about the practical aspects of the treatment. So uh, as far as we know, when we say intraocular tumors, we have a wide variety of lesions. They may be benign, they, they may be mal malignant. They can originate from retina, choroid, RP, whatever you call it. But for the sake of this presentation, we have melanocytic tumors like melanomas that we treat with plaque radiotherapy, vascular tumors, and metastatic tumors, and also from the retinal uh, origin, we have retinoblastoma. So according to the US database, uh, there will be like uh, 3,500 approximately new eye cancers in, in US. It depends on the population. Here I saw the numbers which are very correlated with, the, with those numbers. So we have to treat those lesions, right? So we have to treat those to save the vision, save the patient's life. But how, do, how, are, how are we going to treat those lesions? We have to know that which modality, treatment modality we, we will choose. It depends on the relationship between our treatment option and also uh, between development of metastasis and treatment option. First of all, we need to consider the, to lower the metastatic rates with our treatment. And also, our ocular treatment should increase the rates of survival, also rates of, decrease the rates of, um, or increase the rates of globe salvage and also preserve vision in this modern world. And uh, one uh, rule for, which is true for all kinds of tumors, even they are benign or malignant, the smaller the tumor, the survival, vision, globe salvage rates are higher, okay? So we need to, the, diagnose them earlier and then treat them earlier so that our patients would be satisfied. There are other factors, of course, when you're choosing a, a treatment modality. For example, if you're going to enucleate the eye, you have to know the other eye, right? If the other eye is not seeing well, you cannot just offer enucleation to a, to a patient, right? It's just uh, that doesn't make sense. And also, visual acuity in that eye that we're going to treat, also the um, the anxiety of the patient is even affect the treatment. Sometimes patients doesn't really want any or like radical surgical treatments and they prefer uh, radiotherapy options. Also tumor size, location, spread of the tumor, extent of the tumor, they are all factors uh, when choosing the right treatment modality. So there's no one uh, correct treatment for each patient. It's individualized, as you said. Uh, so there are like radical options like enucleation, exenteration, and there are globe sparing options. Um, I'm not going to go into those details, but we have observing is a very good treatment option for some tumors. I mean, you cannot just offer treatment directly to a very small suspicious melanoma. I mean, there's nothing wrong watching the tumor for two, three months, four months, as you did. Uh, and also we have these. Uh, adjuvant therapies like TTT, cryotherapy, PDT that we don't have right now uh, for two years in Turkey. Uh, we have local resection of options 
as you all showed. We have chemo for RBs, and some uh, reports are coming out for with intravitreal chemotherapeutics for melanomas also recently. And we have these focal radiotherapy options, uh, which are like first the first one is plaque bracket therapy, which is the most like conventional one. And the others are linac-based radiotherapy options, gamma knife and proton beam that we don't have in Turkey. We don't have proton beam. But I have experience with gamma knife and linac-based uh, treatments, which are very, very well. But they're not, in my opinion, they're not precise enough to offer to any patient, especially when the tumor is smaller and like medium-sized, the small size. The uh, plaque break therapy makes a lot of difference. So. Basically, plaque break therapy is, um, it is like a very old but very good effective therapy which dates back to the early 20th century. It's first done at, in, in the year of uh, 1930s. And historically, comp studies show that there is no difference uh, when you treat the patients when the tumor is medium to large size, when you treat them with inoculation or when you irradiate them with plaque break therapy. There was no difference in survival rate, so these, this opened gates for more uh, globe-sparing uh, treatments. And over the decades, there are advancements in imaging, in radiation physics, in the planning of those plaques, and also the plaque designs changed a lot, so it, this, that improved the plaque break therapy uh, a lot. So, what is the advantage of plaque break therapy? First of all, it's, it gives a selective high dose to the tumor area without like with minimal scattering of radiation so that preserving the healthy tissues around the tumor and therefore it, it seems to be safer and more efficacious compared to other external beam radiation radiotherapy options especially for uh, medium and small sized melanomas or other benign and mal malignant tumors too. So where do we use it? We use it for UL melanomas of course we use it for RBs as, as a salvage therapy, which is very effective. Uh, we use it for benign tumors, such as choroidal hemangiomas, where the tumor is not suitable for laser treatments or other kind of treatments when we don't have PDT, for example, right now. And also, uh, we use it for choroidal metastasis a lot. VPT, we, we may use it. I didn't use it till now, but it's, it's, it's logical. And iris melanomas, conjunctival melanomas, it's very, for example, for conjunctival melanomas, it can use as an adjunct treatment. Iris melanomas, it can use as a primary treatment. So there are a lot of uh, indications that uh, plaque therapy can be used. So patient evaluation, we heard, I mean, even I understood, uh, this has been uh, um, told extensively. So imaging is crucial for, for the diagnosis also, but also for the follow-up of the treatment or follow-up of, of the patient. MR, MRI or CT can be done. We are doing uh, CT for some for, for, for particular reason that we are using CT images, I will show you right away, to plan the patient to plaque treatment. So um, our, the new software of, that we are using, it just creates a spherical um, um, recomposition of the retinal surface and re uh, the eye itself and it's superimposed that into red free, like uh, color from the photographs, and there's a 3D, 3D, three-dimensional planning option with CT, I will show right uh, in a minute. So we do CT, in, uh, not MRI, and also metastasis screening can be done. It's very controversial, it's debatable. Uh, I'm not going to enter into that detail. So we have our tumor, so we need to choose a plaque suitable for that tumor, and we, th this should be cost customized based on the size, shape, and location of the tumor, and it should cover the two millimeter from the edge of the tumor. So it, it shouldn't be like four or five millimeters. If the tumor is irregular, it's acceptable, but it should be like right fit for the tumor uh, size and location. It may be notched if, you, if it's close to optic nerve, and we commonly use nowadays iodine uh, seeds uh, on the plaques because these, uh, I will show the disadvantages of those uh, isotopes Rutanium and palladium, are, their, their penetration depth is not very uh, high. So, uh, we are, in our practice, we want to use, we want to irradiate medium to large sized melanoma. So, personally, I use iodine uh, seeds. Uh, and also, palladium are, is, are really hard to find. Uh, rutanium is available. 
again, but it's, it's used in small to medium-sized melanomas, not for uh, larger ones. So how do we do the dose calculation? Dose calculation we do with the collaboration of, with radiation oncologists, of course. And optimal radiation dose is the dose required to achieve maximum tumor control while preserving maximum healthy tissue, okay? And uh, we tend to employ 80 gray at the tumor apex if the tumor is like uh, uniform. And it may change. You can just adjust it according to the tumor's shape and size. Uh, if it's mushroom shape, it's a little bit different. If it's like oval, you know, it, it tends to differ. Uh, now, I want to show how we, how we use it for the... Okay, here. So, this is a... Okay, so this is a treatment... This is a brief of the treatment plan that we take the... Uh, PDF out of the software, so it's it's basically very detailed uh, plan. Here I want to show you this. So this is a reconstruction of the retinal surface with CT. Okay, it, um, it's a spherical 3D reconstruction. So here the darkest, the gray areas are the uh, flat surface that we, uh, we we might expect from the retinal surface, and this area is where the tumor is set. And these is, this is created from these coronal, sagittal, and uh, axial uh, CT images. They are like overimposed, old images, and then the, it creates a 3D, 3D model from the CTs, CT images. And finally, it overlays them. Here is the ultrasound dosimetry. So here we have the 2D model, okay? This is our tumor here. Uh, maybe I can just a little bit make it smaller. Okay, so this is our plaque. This is our tumor. Even if you don't see it, it's under here. I, I know the dimensions, and I put the dimensions in the software. And after that, even the, the software says where, where to put the sutures of uh, the plaque, and what is the distance between them. And it's like a very detailed plan. Of course, in the surgery, you don't... Like, you cannot just go with the plan all, uh, all the time, but it says also if you're going to disinsert the muscle or not to disinsert the muscle. So it's a very detailed plan. For, uh, this is created for each and every patient. This, these are the plaque, the seeds in the, uh, on the plaque. It's a 20 millimeter plaque. And finally, yeah, this is the reconstruction of the CT here. With the CT images, I can see where, where my plaque sits. And this is important when you're planning uh, for a tumor close to the optic nerve, or close to the muscle. So you know where to, uh, where you're gonna uh, struggle with, how you're gonna manage your plaque. So uh, this is very good. And this is a new thing for this software. This this wasn't there like a, two, I think it's not commercial still. It's, it wasn't there for like two years ago. Okay, now we can go back to presentation. Okay, so after we have our plan, now we go to the surgery. So surgery is pretty much straightforward, but the aim of the surgery is put the plaque to the exact location that we want, okay? So uh, we don't want uh, like a deviation of the plaque to, from, for, to, the, to its sides to miss a part of the tumor. So we have to be sure that our plaque is covering the tumor. So I will show two, two cases. One of them is a posterior one, one of them is an anterior located one. Uh, for the posterior ones, can I stop it with this one? Uh, can I stop by pressing? So here, I want here I detach like um, I isolated three muscles. You, I can. I, uh, huh? Just tell me when to stop. Stop, please. Okay. So um, here you can see the transillumination. I'm tr the tumor is inferior located, so I want to see if I can see the tumor extent by transillumination, which I don't expect too much, but, and I didn't see, so here you can see the pars plicata, but you don't really see any uh, transillumination defect. So what we're gonna do here is, if you cannot see the tumor, uh, we're gonna mark, can you start again? So we're gonna mark the tumor axis along the, from limbus to the tumor's belly, where, where, where the centroid of the tumor is. I'm gonna mark an axis here as uh, like, um, my colleagues do all the time. Here, here I put my mark, 
And I do it with indirect ophthalmoscopy. There is nothing, there, there's, that's the best way to do it. You get indirect ophthalmoscopy, you check the anterior border of the tumor, you check the centroid of the tumor, and you just make an axis that you're gonna put, the cent that's gonna center your plaque, okay? And here, this is my mark. This is my mark. And I'm gonna, now we're gonna put a um, fixation suture and check again. This time I'm gonna check the uh, position of the uh, plaque again. Okay, we are done. And this is not enough. After I, even I think that, I checked with the indirect now, and even if I, even I think that I am on the tumor, I will do one other thing. Here comes the suture again. Okay. So, of, of course, we have to be careful when you're just needling a sclera where the tumor lies just underneath. Okay, I'm gonna check with ultrasound, okay? Yes. So it's, it's very useful. So this is the horizontal diameter, you will see. So this is the horizontal, the, you, can, you can see the shadowing from the shield of the plaque. And then this is the vertical diameter. So I'm just checking 360 degrees if, if, the, if the tumor is really under the plaque, okay? So basically, I'm done here, the second fixation suture, and then I'm out of the eye. How can I just go a little bit further? So, but yeah. And we are just closing the tenos and conjunctiva for, okay, this is the second case. This one, this, in this case, I will see the tumor by transformation. In this, in this case, it's easier to locate the tumor. Even you can see through the red reflex the tumor. Just marking just almost like 40% uh, of the anterior location is, will be enough because my plaque is designed for that. And I know that it will cover the uh, posterior margin of the tumor. But also I, I, I intend to check the, also again if it is like going backwards. And that's it. So plaque is in two, two uh, fixation sutures and we are done. <clears throat> this is like a half an hour surgery. And here, I forgot to tell, we disinsert the inferior rectus. This is like the inferior located tumor, it's more anterior location. And the belly of the tumor was right under the inferior rectus from the, from the software, even from the uh, examination. Now you can tell that you're gonna disinsert the muscle because this is a 20 millimeter bevic plaque, like Combs, Combs bevic plaque. This, these are a little bit uh, thicker. So it's like a Coca-Cola um, cap. So. so uh, I mean, you cannot just put it in without disinserting the muscle. And we are done. So plaque removal, it, it, it changes, but we can remove the plaque in several days, uh, depending on the dose of the isodo, like the, um, the seeds and the size of the tumor. And after we remove it, we also control the seeds, that uh, sometimes these seeds can just fall off uh, to, into the orbit. And also the extraocular muscles are uh, reinserted, conjunctiva is repositioned. So effectiveness, when you, so 90, uh, local tumor control rates of plaque brachytherapy is like close to 95%, which uh, my colleagues also uh, stated. It's a very good uh, result for those tumors. And factors influencing the success are size, location, and genetic factors, because genetics determines a lot in uh, melanomas. We don't have the um, finance, financial status to look to genetic background of the patients. I don't know if you can do it in, in Bosnia, because it's too expensive. It's like I, it was like close to $10,000 in US, this like genetic profiling. And we, that's why we don't do it. And also there's no like adjuvant treatment for metastatic lesions, so uh, there's no point also for the treatment. Okay, I will show you some examples. For example, this is a medium-sized corridon melanoma, which is like uh, measuring the thickness, is six, thick, thickness was almost seven millimeters. Uh, after 18 months, it is 3.28 millimeters, at like almost three millimeters. We don't expect the tumor be gone. I mean, it's like, it's like a collapsing building, so there may be some thickness. If you do TTT on top of it, it may even decrease more, but I'm not a big fan of TTT. And this is like a very peripheral, like quite peripheral lesion. So I don't do TTT uh, on a regular basis. This is a large melanoma located in the infernasal part. Uh, 
after treatment, very nice regression to three millimeters. This is a choroidal metastasis, even though there is no visual uh, hope for this eye because the RP is gone, as you can see. Here you, this, you, you see this lumpy, bumpy appearance, which is typical for metastasis. And after the plaque treatment, uh, you, you, you can see that the full tumor regression. For choroidal hemangiomas, so we don't have PT, PDT. This one was treated with PDT already once, and the visual acuity started to decrease to 0.3. Of course, in this case, we put a plaque, but we use, of course, low dose radiation in this case. And after, after eight months, the tumor thickness decreased, and also the subretinal fluid, intraretinal fluid is gone, and best correct visual acuity was 0.7 in this eye. An example from an anterior segment uh, uh, melanoma is an iridociliar melanoma. I mean, I think of excision of this lesion, but it's a little bit extensive. Uh, here almost, there is like a ceiling here a little bit, and it's almost 180 degrees, so I, I didn't choose to excise it, so we plaqued it. Very nice regression, very nice regression, you can see. Tumor is gone, right? there's, there's fibrosis and that's it. Of course we have cataracts, the, the patient developed glaucoma, but this is acceptable, I mean, you're treating a malignant tumor, and uh, which is occupying 180 degrees of the angle. Of, I mean, any kind of treatment that you're going to do here will cause uh, glaucoma or cataract. Of course, we have complications. I'm not go into the details. We have radiation retinopathy. We have maculopathy. Uh, most fearsome, I think, is the optic neuropathy, which is like irreversible. I mean, the, most of the visual loss uh, is irreversible visual losses from the optic neuropathy. We have anterior segment complications and also more severe complications which, may, which patients may lose the eyes as like retinal detachment uh, and less severe but more frequent uh, patients may experience dry eye. Okay. Uh, follow up. I, I follow up the patients every three months. I do what I do at the baseline visit all the time. All imaging is done from the beginning. Uh, I don't employ metastatic screening extensively, maybe uh, once a year uh, or once in two years PET CT. I offer other than that abdominal ultrasound, uh, liver function tests and, uh, and pulmonary x-rays in my uh, regimen. And then if, if the patient develops retinopathy or like uh, macular edema or optic neuropathy, I tend to inject anti-VGFs, uh, local steroid injections, I, I do regularly panretinal or like sector uh, photocoagulation to these patients even uh, before they develop, develop the radiation side effects. And of course, cataract surgery if they need it, IOP monitoring is like uh, crucial in these cases. And if there is a recurrence, the recurrences can be treated with transpupillary thermotherapy. Again, salvage radiation and also enucleation is I think a very good option when there is a recurrence for those tumors. So thank you for uh, listening to me.